Good morning. Welcome to All Saints Episcopal Church. On the second Sunday after Pentecost, please stand as you are able and join us in singing our opening hymn in the blue hymnal in your pew rack, Christ for the World We Sing, hymn number 537. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is that not what's in there? Nope. I'll leave the is. <laughs> I was just seeing if you were paying attention. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
with you. Let us pray. O oh God, your never failing providence sets in order all things, both in heaven and earth. Put away from us, we entreat you, all hurtful things, and give us those things which are profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Peace be seated. The first lesson is taken from the first book of Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end for I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good, good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will now say Psalm 139 verses 1 through 5 and 12 through 17 in unison. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me it is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. 
Your works are wonderful, and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret, and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb, and all of them were written in your book, and they were fashioned day by day, when as yet there was none of them. How deep I find your thoughts, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. The second lesson is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are aff afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body of death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh, so death is at work in us, but life in you. The word of the Lord. Using the black and red hymnal in the pew rack, please stand as you are able and join us in singing our sequence hymn, hymn number 64, I Love to Tell the Story. I love to tell the story of unseen things above. Oh, my 
gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. One Sabbath, Jesus and his disciples were going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful, not lawful, on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God with a beartar, was high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accurse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart, and he said to them, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. When is the last time you prophesied? Amen? When is the last time you prophesy? I know. That probably seems like a strange question, especially to a congregation of Episcopalians. But it shouldn't be completely strange because just a couple of Sundays ago, we celebrated the outpouring of God's Spirit on Pentecost. The Spirit of God poured out on all flesh so that all may do what? Prophesy. And if you recall, we define prophecy as foretelling, disclosing the mind of God, not foretelling the future, but rather describing, heralding, proclaiming God's desired and purposed future. So if that's true, and if we received the Holy Spirit at baptism, then again I ask, when was the last time that you prophesied? When is the last time you declared the word of the Lord to situations and scenarios. We've heard this morning a passage from 1 Samuel. It tells the story 
that is probably familiar to a lot of us, the story of the prophet Samuel, who was born for visions and divine words. My eyes were fixed upon the first three verses of our reading today. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. At this point in Israel's history, things had gotten so bad, things had gotten so interminable that there were no longer any visions, no more dreams, and the voice of the Lord was rare. Even the priest, Eli, who worked day in and day out in the temple, had no words or vision from the Lord. And even though the phrase, his eyes were growing dim, has a reference to his age, yes, I think it's a little more than that. You see, Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who also served the Lord in the tabernacle, and they did a lot of evil in the sight of the Lord. They had the position of serving God's people but what they ultimately did was exploit them. You can read 1 Samuel chapter 2 for context. But one of the most damnable things that they did, besides sleeping with some of the women, is when folks would come and bring their offering, the rule was that they would put the offering of meat in the pot or the cauldron or on the fire as an offering to God, and then the priest or the priest's assistants would stick a fork in the pot, and whatever they pulled out out of the pot, that was for the priest to eat. That was for the priest to be compensated, if you will. But no, what Hophni and Phinehas did was they said, we want our portion before it's put on the offering. And if you don't give it to us, we're going to take it by force. And so what ended up was happening was Hophni and Phinehas would take the fattiest, juiciest, most expensive part of the meat for themselves and leave the rest for God. That's called exploitation. And the problem is, Eli, their father, Eli, the priest, would not exercise his authority over them and reign in his sons. The Bible says that his sons blasphemed God and that Eli did nothing to restrain them. In fact, the Bible says he honored his sons above God. Instead of doing what was right, he covered for them. This is tantamount to letting bruh man stay in your house knowing he took them folks TV. But that doesn't happen to us, right? We know people that that has happened to, I'm sure. For this reason, God deposed Eli and his house from leadership. And it was as if 
because Eli refused to use his eyes and his ears to see and hear the abuses of his sons. Rather, he became implicit in them that God allowed his eyes to grow dim and his ears to grow dull, even while still remaining in a position of religious authority. He had the robes and the responsibility and the prestige of the office, but no vision and no word of the Lord to go with it. Did you catch that? He had the power. He, I'm sorry, he had the, uh, the, the position, and he had the prestige, and he had the place, but he did not have any power to go with it. So you can see the world that the prophet Samuel was born into was in need of divine words and a divine vision, not just because the world was going off the rails, but because the religious institution was incapable of giving said word as well. My sisters and brothers, I submit to you today that our world and our time is in just such a need for a prophetic word from the Lord. The church needs a prophetic word. The church needs to be reminded of God's desired purpose and future for the church. There are a whole lot of words being spoken in today's, age, today's day and age, especially since covid because nowadays, all you need to be a pastor or a preacher is a camera phone and a ring light, a good internet connection, a Zoom account, a YouTube channel, and you can get on the internet and spout all kinds of things. You can say all kinds of things. My brothers and sisters, the amount of things that I've seen on the internet over the past few weeks about folks getting honorary doctorates. They have not done any matriculation. I saw one that said he was receiving an honorary doctorate degree while working on his associate's degree. An honorary doctorate of I'm not picking praise dance ministry. What even is that? There are a whole lot of people saying a whole bunch of words. And I think just like in Samuel's day, the word of the Lord is rare. The true word of the Lord is rare. Everybody has ideas. But who has the word of the Lord? The church needs a word from the Lord. The church needs to be reminded that she is a spouse to one husband and Lord Jesus Christ, and that it is Jesus that sets the tone. It is Jesus that sets the pace. It is Jesus that sets the mission. It is Jesus that sets the directives for her. We just sang the hymn, I love to tell the story of Jesus and his glory of Jesus and his Love. The church needs to be reminded of what our story is and that it is not culture that drives us, it is Christ. Indeed, just like in Samuel's day, there were no visions and the voice of the Lord was rare, but that does not mean that God was sitting idly by. That does not mean that God was not up to something. God was raising up Samuel as a prophet. God is raising up Samuels as prophet. And I want to remind you, my, my brother and sister prophets, that the prophets in the Holy Scriptures primarily spoke to the religious audiences of their day, the religious audiences of their day, not the world at large, but the religious audiences of their day. They had the primary task of reminding those who already knew right from wrong that they actually had to do what was right. That's what I mean when I say the church is in need 
of a prophetic voice because we know what is right, but we don't always do what is right. As Jesus talked about in the Gospels today, sometimes we know what is right, but we don't always do what is right because it'll be frowned upon. It'll get people asking questions. Why are you pucking the grains of wheat, the heads of the grain off of the head? Why are you healing on the Sabbath? Even though it's the right thing to do, people will cite rules and regulations and canons and culture. Let me move on. Consider that Eli raised Samuel as an apprentice. And even as a young child, Samuel hears a voice calling to him. You remember, Allison read it to us this morning. Eli tells him that it is God that's speaking to him and that the next time he hears the voice, Samuel should say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. We all know that story. Speak, Lord, for your servant is is listening. We sang the hymn just last week, here am I, send me, right? I'll go, Lord, if you lead me. We sing it, and I cry. I don't know about you. I always cry. But here's the thing that we may not always remember. Eli told Samuel to say to the voice, speak, Lord, your servant is listening, and come back and tell me what the Lord said. You see, it's not enough to hear the word of the Lord. You got to go back and tell people what God said. But this puts Samuel in an unenviable position to hear a harsh word about a church, I mean, a man he loves, and then needing to tell the church, I mean, him, what thus says the Lord. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Much to our surprise, though, Eli receives the word with humility. The word of the Lord comes to Samuel and tells Samuel, tell Eli that I am getting ready to wipe him and his house out. But this Thus and so. Now, mind you, Eli already knows this. He's already informed of his fate in 1 Samuel chapter 2. But God reveals this to Samuel. And Samuel doesn't respond with animosity. Samuel does not respond with pushback. Samuel doesn't respond with, God ain't told you that. Samuel doesn't respond with, well, that's not the way that we've done it for the past 25 years. We are Anglicans, by the way. We are Episcopalians all the way. That's just not the way that it's done. They didn't respond to Eli, didn't respond to Samuel by saying, well, you know, you're just a young man. You're just now coming into the ministry. There are lots of things that you probably don't know yet. No. Samuel, Eli responds with humility and says, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Sometimes it is the church herself that needs to hear the hard truths, not just speak them to everybody else. Sometimes it is the church that needs to be able to take what it dishes out. Before the world will ever become anti-racist, the church is going to have to be anti-racist. Sundays are the most, is the most segregated day and has the most segregated hours in the United States. Gender inequality plays itself out right here in the church. It's not only the world and its leaders that are tone deaf to the plight and to the marginalized, but sometimes the church can be just as blind and tone deaf as well. We need the prophets in our church. That's you. We need the prophets in our church to prophesy to us and say, wake up. Jesus is alive. The Holy Spirit is real. And we have work to do on ourselves in addition to the work we must do in God's world in Jesus' name. So where does that leave us now, these thousands of years after Samuel? 
our lesson reminds us today that even if the religious leaders are spiritually and morally blind, God provides that the lamp in the tabernacle doesn't go out. God does not abandon his people to be led by the uncourageous or the deaf, that he will not have his people rely on parsons with pulpits, on pedestals who have no power to effect real change, no interest in upsetting the status quo, no desire in reigning in abuses and exploitation. He raises up prophets like Samuel who will please God by seeing what others can't and saying what others won't, even when they have to say them to the religious, to the Christians, to the Democrats, to the Republicans, to the pro-life, to the pro-choice, to those who claim to know what is right but still will not do what is right. Those who wear vestments but will not vex the philosophies that keep the systems of spiritual and social oppression in place. I am so glad that God raises up prophets to keep me honest. I am so glad that God raises up people to keep the church honest. I am so glad that people, that God raises up people that says, I know this is what we've been doing for the last 10 years, but I think we need to change direction. So glad that people rise up and say, that the process for discipline of clergy in the Episcopal Church needs to be reworked and needs to be made more transparent. I am so glad that God raises up people that says, no, I have experienced ageism. I have experienced sexism right here in the church to keep the church constantly going back to say, what is the word from the Lord for us today. We need the words of the Lord and visions for our day. There is still so much work the church must do in herself and for the sake of the world. I've already mentioned racial injustice. I've already mentioned gender inequality. But there also still seems to be a good old boy club in the church that insulates the men at the expense of the women in the church. The church is still trying to figure out how to best provide pastoral care for members of the LGBTQ community. The church still has something to say about climate matters, mental health matters, economic inequalities, and gun violence. And some may say, well, Reverend, all of that is political. Well, yeah. Politics comes from the Greek word polis, which means city or people. The church has a moral obligation to talk about these issues because the people in our pews are some of the same people who go to the polls, who make the policies, who do the policing, and make the products. Where else are they going to hear the old, old story of Jesus and God's love if we don't tell them? We have a moral obligation to speak about these issues because some of the folks in our very pews are suffering from some of these policies that keep the poor poor and the hungry hungry and the homeless homeless and the mentally disturbed mentally disturbed. If we don't use our eyes and ears to see that the church perpetuates injustice in herself, let alone to see the injustice in the world around us, we are no better than Eli who refused to challenge his sons, who have robes, who have ritual, but no moral power, just like Eli. If we only pay lip service to justice or do the bare minimum of courtesy and fairness, then as Jesus says, we are no better than sinners. Without a visionary prophet to remind us of our obligations and tell us the truth that we're not practicing what we're preaching. And without the words of the Lord, how will we be able to fulfill our mission to be good stewards of Christ's ministry? How will we fulfill our obligation to God and to ourselves and to the world? Martin Luther King Jr. 
quoted Harry uh, Emerson Fosdick when he said that any religion that professes concerns for the souls of men and is not equally concerned about the slums that damn them, the economic conditions that strangle them, and the social conditions that cripple them is a spiritually moribund religion only waiting for the day to be buried. Faith without works is dead. And I don't want you to get it twisted. All Saints Episcopal Church is doing a phenomenal job trying to serve this community. All Saints Episcopal Church is doing a phenomenal job welcoming members of our neighborhood, the university district, being a polling place, opening our doors to members of the community at large to have funerals here and receptions here. We are doing great work and we're also working on our building to make it more accessible, more handicapped accessible. We are doing the work. And what I have told our vestry and what we have identified at our annual meeting is that on top of all of that, there is still more work that we can be doing. There is too much talent. There is too much youth. And notice I'm not talking about age. There is too much youth and vitality in this church. I know that there is more that we can do to help other people. I know that there is more that we can do to show people the love of God, not just tell them, but to show them. I know that an opportunity is going to come by so that we can help those who are hungry and those who are in need by helping out at the ministry at Crossroads. I'm just laying some foundation because you're going to hear about this more next week. But do you see what I'm saying? When the opportunities come, we should jump at the chance to show people that God loves them, to show up at crossroads and to show those young kids that there are people who love them and will spend time with them and will read with them and will play kickball or fetch or whatever else that these kids want to let them know that not every adult is out to slam them just because their pants sag or they misspell a word. There are people out there who need to know the love of God. We have to continue to do our maintenance, but all saints, we must continue to do our ministry. When is the last time that we opened our mouths and we prophesied about the purposed future that God has for this neighborhood? the purpose future that God has for Seven Mile and Liver Noise and Sherwood Forest and Palmer Woods and the Gulf uh, neighborhood. When is the last time that we open our mouths and prophesy, even though it will be convenient and even though it may mean some of us doing something that we say we never, ever, ever do again, like teach Sunday school or prepare for vacation Bible school or make sandwiches? When is the last time that we opened our mouths and prophesied to our city council and our block clubs and to d Wynn and to the mayor and to our councilwomen, to our neighbors, I don't know, to ourselves? When is the last time that we showed up to show others that God has more for them uh, than anybody can imagine? As we read on Pentecost Sunday just two weeks ago, can these bones live? The answer is yes. So let us get back to work. Let us open our mouths wide. Let us prophesy. Amen. standing as you're able.
we declare our faith and trust using the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. In confidence, we offer our prayers to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy, that the church may shine with the glory of the face of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy, that the harvests of summer be justly distributed among the hungry. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy, that the laws and customs of our society be observed with charity and goodwill. Let us pray to the Lord. That all those graduating from school may continue to grow in knowledge and wisdom, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That each Sabbath brings us closer, closer to the health and wholesomeness of God's reign, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That all the sick and the suffering, especially Arnie, Bianca, Helmeter, Catherine G., Charles, Crystal, Daryl, David, Dean, Delano, Edward G., Alinda, Emmett, Eric, Funteller, Eleanor, James B., Janice, Janie, Joseph, Joyce C., Joe Mar, Kat, Kenneth B., Laurent, Lena, Lenore, Leslie, Lucia, Majid, Marcus R., Marilyn, Martha, Muriel, Nicole, Oscar, Patrick G., Pauline G., Robert W., Rosalind, Ruby, Sean, Sheila A., Valerie, Vicki, Walter, and Willie F. May be healed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. In the communion of the Holy Spirit, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, and with all the saints in light. Let us commend our lives and the lives of one another to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Please offer your own intercessions at this time. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Bonnie, our bishop, Moises, bishop of the Dominican Republic, Elizabeth, Donald and Craig, bishops in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, mother of the savior, Arab American Christian ministry, Dearborn, St. Stephen's, Troy, Holy Comforter, Dejaban, Dominican Republic, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For those celebrating birthdays, especially Sydney, 
Lenore. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We carry in our own bodies the dying of your son. Have pity on us and answer our prayers. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what, by what we, we have done and by, by what we have left undone. We have, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We, we have not loved our neighbors, neighbors as ourselves. We are, we are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the, for the sake, sake of your Son, Jesus, Jesus Christ, have, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand as you're able. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please exchange signs of God's peace. God's peace. Peace. God's peace. God's peace. Hey Amen. You can be seated this afternoon. So good to see all of you here this morning. Did anybody learn any of the steps to the Tamil hustle between this week and last week? No? All right. I'm not saying that it's mission central, but I'm just saying, you know, I'm still rejoicing in the glory of the Trinity um, and this Christ, this God that dances and celebrates and rejoices over us. And knowing that we have such a profound mission and task to spread the mission of God in our world, even if that world is just the world that exists between us and our kids and grandkids and great-grands. Uh, we need spiritual nourishment to do that as well as the Word of God. And so all who claim the faith of Jesus, all who are intending to stretch their muscles uh, to proclaim and prophesy God's desired future for the world and for those you love, I invite you to come forward to receive bread and wine, nourishment for your body and your soul as you go out this week and just speak to those bones and say, God has a life for you. And that is also the truth for all of those who are watching online. Welcome to our service today. And while we are receiving communion, know that the Holy Spirit of God is communing with you spiritually wherever and whenever you are watching this broadcast. While we prepare the gifts uh, of bread and wine and prepare the table, the ushers will be moving down the aisles, and perhaps some of you are feeling called to support the mission of this congregation as we continue to speak life into our, uh, our, into our neighborhood. And so while the ushers are moving down the aisle, please feel free uh, to uh, share with what you have with, uh, with us. Please know that I nor anybody in this church sticks a fork in it and takes any of it out. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about that. Please uh, share uh, generously as you can and know that um, uh, we are being good stewards of the resources that we have here at All Saints Episcopal Church. And for those who would like to give online electronically, you can do that by going to our website, allsaintsdetroit.org, and clicking on the giving tab. We'll come back a little later on with some more announcements, but for now, our offertory hymn is hymn number 145 in the black and red hymnal, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. You may remain seated while it is being sung. And my sisters and brothers, I do have it right this week 
the Eucharistic prayer is Eucharistic prayer C, which has some back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so please uh, follow along in your bulletin so that we may pray over the bread and wine together. Let us with gladness present the oblations and offerings of our life and labor to the Lord. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. 
At your command all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets and their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. From the primal elements you brought forth the human race, <coughs> trust us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. And so, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praise as Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say,
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for a word of welcome and some announcements. Hello, and a warm welcome to all who have gathered and worship here at All Saints, and those who have joined us in worship by Zoom. Hopefully, you will take away from today's worship something that will be a blessing to you and give you strength in your walk with the Lord this week. Well, let's ask, are there any first-time worshipers here with us? It seems there's not. We encourage all to read the announcements so that you'll be kept up to date on what is happening to all saints and throughout the diocese. And we have a couple of announcements outlined for you just to bring to your attention today. The vestry will meet today at 1.30. And we're asking all vestry members to be on time. <laughs> and next Sunday, the night, we welcome the Reverend Teresa Watkin, president of the church at Crossroads, priest rather, of the church at Crossroads as our preacher and celebrant. And she will also share with us opportunities to support the ministry of crosswords during our hospitality hour and we encourage everyone to come you know when we invite someone to come to speak to us it's kind of disheartening when no one is here you know when hardly anybody shows up so we ask everyone to come out and, su and support next week we also appreciate and thank magnus and myrtle phillips who donated the 150-foot expanding garden holes. Thank you. And the Episcopal Church women invites you to come out and support them at their ECW Street Fair on Saturday, June 22nd, from 9 to 4 in our parking lot. Each rental space is $20 donation. So we ask everyone to please support the ECW by picking up a flyer from the table in the Northrex and sharing with others. And also a reminder of Bible study, Thursdays at 5.30 p.m. And it seems for the next, um, for the summer basically, it will be a study of the letter to the Ephesians. And everyone is asked to please read the letter to the Ephesians, Paul to the Ephesian church. And that's about all I have for you. And I'm going to turn it back over now to Reverend Estes and to the wardens. May God bless you all. Thank you, uh, Mr. Price, for uh, those words of welcome and announcements. I do also want to convey uh, my thanks uh, to the Phillips for bringing, uh, for donating that 150 foot holes and lift it up as proof again that when there is a need in this community and it is known, we respond. And I am so grateful uh, for the work that all of us uh, do. Uh, some of that work is 
up front and in our faces, and some of it is behind the scenes. But everybody doing something to make the kingdom of God more of a reality day by day in this place. I am always so grateful. And I love what Mr. Price also said. It's not just announcements about our church in the bulletin and in the, uh, the, the, the newsletter, um, but also information about what's going on throughout the Episcopal Church um, it are, is in both of those documents. So please uh, take home, read, learn, mark, and inwardly digest them. Uh, we know that we have general convention coming up, and so I and Mrs. Estes are, are deputies, and so uh, please pray for us as we get ready for general convention as well. Uh, I see a hand from our senior warden. Is there something you'd like to add? Okay, for those, thank you, for those who didn't hear that, there's a letter from Crossroads of Michigan uh, uh, that if anybody would like to know in advance more about uh, the project and some of the things that uh, uh, Pastor Joaquin will be talking about, that, that letter is available where? In the Narthex? It is available in the Narthex, and you are welcome to peruse it um, as you uh, go to coffee hour today. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand for the blessing. Life is short, and we do not have long to gladden the hearts of those who make the journey with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 129 in the black and red hymnal. I am thine, O Lord.
Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia.